Right. So again, this is our June 2021 meeting. It, the presentation is biomimicry and positive impacts in the built environment. Our speakers today are Chris Allen Jacobs and Nicole Miller at Biomimicry 3.8. As it mentions in our flyer, but I'll read a little bit of it. Chris Allen is a senior consultant in the San Francisco office of the Advanced Planning Group of Jacobs. With 30 plus years consulting experience, he works with teams to integrate sustainability and resilience into business planning and design for a range of private and public sector clients all around the globe. Guided by strategic thinking and an interactive process, Chris, Chris specializes in working with clients and teams to drive innovative outcomes that create new business and social value. He serves as the Jacobs Strategic Alliance liaison to Biomimicry 3.8 for ecologically aligned regenerative design and development. Um, and Nicole Miller is the managing director of Biomimicry 3.8, a certified B Corp and social enterprise dedicated to helping change makers uh, create a more sustainable and just world by emulating nature's designs and core principles. Her background in corporate sustainability and global supply chain development support her role in driving internal strategy, projects, and initiatives as she works to bring biomimicry solutions to clients around the world. Since joining in 2012, she has overseen the development of key strategic partnerships to increase access to biomimicry and worked with clients such as Google, Johnson & Johnson, Interface, Jacobs, and multiple that are listed out. Uh, Nicole has a unique grasp of how to position great science to drive commercial practice and ultimately market transformation. And with that, I will stop sharing and let you two present. Okay, great. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, um, Michelle. And let's see, tell me when you can see it in please download it. We'll shift over hopefully here shortly. This takes my little minute. There we go. You Got see it. that okay? Okay, yep. yes. Awesome. All right. So well, thank you for having us um, today. We're gonna kind of take you through um, a couple things that we hope you find helpful. Um, Michelle, thank you for the introductions. Um, Chris is gonna give a little bit of an overview of how Jacobs um, works together with B3. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what biomimicry is and how it's used in the built environment. Um, and then we'll really just kind of walk you through examples. Um, that's really the best way to, to get um, an understanding to see applications. So Chris will talk about some specific examples um, that we've worked on together at, at Jacobs uh, to give kind of a more thorough uh, review of application. So that's kind of what we have lined up for you today. Um, and we want this to be obviously interactive so if there's any slide that um, you have questions on or want um, to go deeper just raise your hand um, and we can certainly pause there and, and answer questions so feel free to interrupt at any point um okay i'm not sure if how many have actually um heard of biomimicry but uh um, we'll, we'll, get, uh, we'll give a little bit of an overview of that, but we're kind of assuming that it's new to everyone. Um, so I'll I'll do that. But first, Chris, do you want to kind of give an overview of Jacobs and B3.8? Sure. Thanks, Nicole. We're excited to uh, spend this time with you guys. And Jacobs have been working with Biomimicry 3.8, I think, for almost eight years now on a variety of projects around the world. And it was about a year and a half ago that we were able to complete a formal strategic alliance teaming agreement with Biomimicry 3.8. And you can see there on the slide. And, and the purpose is really to deliver leading edge sustainability thinking and design services for our clients. Um, Jacobs is uh, committed to innovation and bringing kind of leading edge thinking to sustainability. And um, the, the collaboration with Biomimicry 3.8 and bringing ecological intelligence to our projects is is uh, really important to us to, to kind of driving innovation and finding new ways to solve uh, the problems that face us. So uh, we're working closely on a range of projects now around the world, and we'll be uh, talking through those uh, and how we're how that 
how we're leveraging the partnership, how we're applying biomimicry principles to drive new value. And uh, when we get to the project section, we'll be talking uh, about what that looks like in action. So just a little bit of framing there on how, how Jacobs and, and B3A are working together. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, okay, so for to answer probably a question that several of you might have thought is, what is Biomimicry 3.8? What does that stand for? So 3.8 stands for the 3.8 billion years of R&D in nature. So 3.8 billion years ago is when life first appeared on Earth. So we essentially use that 3.8 billion years in our R&D process um, to come up with our solution space. So think of it as you have the most informed lab you could ever need um, in, in the 3.8 billion years of R&D in nature. And that's essentially what we bring to the table. Um, but in terms of a definition, we really use um, biomimicry as, as the emulation of nature's time-tested design strategies to create more effective, resilient, and regenerative design. Um, so it's, it's a science-based approach to provide essentially inherently sustainable solutions that are nature-inspired, nature-based, and regenerative. And for us at Biomimicry 3.8, how we approach biomimicry um, is really through this lens that it's a new way of viewing and valuing nature, not based on what we can extract from the natural world, but what we can learn from it. Um, and we use biological intelligence to inform and evaluate design to ensure that design is to the benefit of, of all life. And what do I mean by that? Um, is when we're designing now, oftentimes we're designing for efficiency or we're designing for aesthetics, uh, but there's negative externalities in that process. And I think what we've all experienced now is that those negative externalities are catching up with us in terms of the amount of harm that materials or design can actually do to human health and, and the ecosystem. So for example, you can have a beautiful and efficient building that has harmful materials the damages human health and the local ecosystem. That, in our interpretation, is not good design. Um, but a building that's holistically designed to benefit the community and the ecosystem that's, that supports it, um, that the community is better, that the ecosystem is better because the building is there, um, while also looking at long-term performance, um, is the truly good design. So it's really looking kind of holistically at how can we create design that provides benefit versus um, create design that is, you know, solving for one particular um, criteria, but really a holistic suite of benefits that, that can be delivered. Um, and really nature is, is the most incredible blueprint for that in terms of looking at multifunctional design, looking at regenerative design, design that provides benefits. So we use that essentially as our kind of framework for how we bring solutions uh, to the uh, design need, design challenge, uh, to help kind of open that solution space for holistic thinking and positive impact. We've been doing this work um, since 1998. We've worked with over 150 plus clients. Um, in multiple different industries. And um, as you can see from some of the logos here and, and the language on, this, on the slide, you know, we've worked from, on everything from the replacement of polyurethane foam to creating um, cities and buildings that function like forests. Um, and I think one thing that's really important about biomimicry and probably ex most exciting um, about biomimicry is that it really is industry agnostic whether you're looking at a very specific you know uh, problem within a um, consumer product goods space or if you're looking at a systems design strategy if you're looking at a building if you're looking at a city it can apply it at multiple different levels right so the fact that it's industry and 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 problem agnostic if you will it really allows us to to um, apply it in, in many different ways. And what we've found over the years is that by working with a multitude of different industries, we start to find kind of um, 
commonalities in terms of how we can start to to solve um, different challenges and different problems, um, all using the essentially the same biology, but in different applications. And it's something that um, you might have heard of. Biomimicry has been around for hundreds of years. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci is well known for emulating nature in his designs. Um, it's also uh, well used in indigenous cultures as well. And it's now really in the zeitgeist um, as a design practice that yields holistic design solutions um, that supports the growing needs and demands uh, faced by designers today. So um, you'll see these are just a couple different examples. Fortune magazine named it as a top trend in 2017. And I think one thing I find is that even as I read, you know, business and strategy books, nature is constantly used as a comparative um, or an analogy to help to understand um, concepts and ideas. And that's a lot of what we're doing, right? It, we, it really, and we'll give some examples of how that's applied, but we really help people kind of understand in, in, a, new, um, in a new space, a new mindset um, that helps bring kind of new thinking. This is um, one of my favorite quotes um, from Steve Jobs, where he says, I think the biggest innovations of the 21st century will be at the intersection of biology and technology. And that's, you know, that's really where biomimicry sits, is at this intersection um, here where we're looking at biology, nature, and life, and these 3.8 billion years of R&D nature, um, and design, technology, and innovation. So we're kind of at this intersection and, and uniquely positioned at this intersection to develop um, inherently sustainable solutions based on kind of these two fields of, of two spheres of influence and practice. So we could probably spend a whole hour and and we actually have an entire training programs that are week long or two years long or four years long um, through different partnerships uh on biomimicry so the the field itself is is quite deep um and there's a lot of information so should you want to know more on just biomimicry itself we have a, a handful of resources that we can share um, so that's just kind of a, a quick overview of what it is um, what we thought we'd do is share some examples so you can see kind of how it's applied in the built environment so you have a little bit more specific understanding of how we've used it um, and hopefully that gives you a little bit more of a tangible um, visual around how we apply biomimicry. Um, and again, feel free to ask questions as we go through this. Okay, so this is the U.S. Coast Guard headquarters. This is in, based in Washington, D.C. on the Potomac River. Um, it was the largest construction undertaking in the um, in GSA, the General Service Administration's history. Um, the building itself has a consolidated workforce of nearly 4,000 employees um, who were previously scattered among 24 locations around um, DC. So the building itself or the, um, the site itself is a 176 acre campus. Um, and the building is 1.2 uh, million square feet of building um, on that campus. So with this particular project, we were solving for a couple different things. We were solving for how can a building of this size and scale fit into an existing campus um, and, and surrounding area without being a massive eyesore. So previously this was a hospital site. And so they wanted to build this, um, the Coast Guard, build the, the headquarter building to, to fit into place. Um, they needed it to be obviously very large, but they wanted it to kind of, they wanted it to fit to place. So that was kind of design challenge one. Um, and then the other thing that we're looking at, given the um, the area, and you can kind of see here, and I have some more images that will depict this, but there's a slope here that you can see. So for this particular site, when we were talking about how to fit into place, and we were also really looking at how can we fit into place well, and in particular, um, because it was based on, because it is based on um, uh, the Potomac River, how can we use the site to effectively manage stormwater runoff in a way that actually filters and cleans water um, for storage and landscape? Um, and and at the, the because the site was 
um, a hospital before it, there was actually um, contaminated soil. Um, so the concept of, of cleaning and filtering water as it ran off was, was an important factor to the site because they really wanted within the community to make sure that people knew that the soil itself had been taken care of um, and that the mitigation that they were doing and the design that they were doing was actually to help um, improve and to, to have positive impact to, to the area. So what the designers um, in, on this particular project, we were working with HOK and what we looked at in terms of um, those kind of two criteria fitting into place and filtering and, and what would that look like, uh, we helped the design team kind of address those functional needs uh, by looking at different um, local species that, that perform those functions and, and look broadly across the biological taxa to see, you know, what are the what are the different species that perform that function well? And um, and looking at that, oh, this is just a summary. So looking at that, those kind of challenge spaces, the this inspiration from nature was beaver ponds um, because they have a series of barriers and filters that clean and, and manage water. So that was kind of the design inspiration was, was looking at how beaver ponds do that to figure out how we could de design um, a system that would support and meet the functional needs. So when kind of asking the question of, you know, well, what would nature do? How would nature design this? And when we look to the strategies around those beaver ponds, you can see here we have nature's design looking at the series of upstream barriers to slow water flow and, and how that works. And then the design principle, you know, applying that principle of a series of upstream barriers to, to slow water flow was then essentially um, dis, uh, applied to the kind of rooftop design here, not only to filter the water, but also to solve for leakage along the way. Uh, so this was kind of the, the inspiration that we took. And then in working with the design team, came up with a series of kind of design strategies and interventions um, to help uh, solve for that. So when we applied that principle um, from those kind of principles from nature and that methodology of tiered systems, um, we we're kind of solving for the design need of, of the local landscape and, and the community need uh, to manage and filter and, and store water. So as you can see, the um, the design here for this kind of step down courtyard um, edges and green roofs provide this kind of continuity between the surrounding woodland here um, and into the into the landscape itself. Um, and what was important, another thing to kind of note is the um, around this campus, adjacent to this campus, is historic government campuses. So we really, it, the, the importance of blending in was like a massive underscore to this project. Um, so that's a lot of, of kind of what we wanted to do with the landscaping as well, like native plants uh, that really fit in um, to the design. So as you can see here, the stormwater management plan kind of shows the water flow um, on the site of the tiered roofs. Um, and ultimately, um, for, for this particular project with the, um, the rainwater that falls onto the green roof uh, kind of permeates through the root plants and the soil and into the drainage system that leads to the stormwater ponds for reuse um, in irrigation, vegetation, and hardscape featured um, throughout the site, which reflected the character of, of the eco region and surrounding areas. Um, and another thing to note here, so that while this is an 11 story building, what you see from, from the street level kind of walking in is really only two, two levels um, of, of the building itself because the way that it was built into the, to the slope um, as, as well. So that's again, kind of solving for that kind of fit to place. So a lot of different um, thinking around how, how to design in, in a way that's fit to place, looking at nature for different inspiration around that really was um, a lot of what made this project successful um, from the landscape design perspective. Another example, this is the um, 
uh, a project that we did with the U.S. Forest Service. This is a Spring Mountain Visitor Gateway uh, Center. It's about 30 miles outside of Las Vegas in the Spring Mountains, which goes from desert to alpine conditions. And the project site itself was kind of in this middle zone, this transition zone, uh, which makes it a complicated site to design for um, from, a, from a building perspective um, and, a, and a systems perspective because of the extreme um, fluctuation in temperatures going from uh, very cold at night to very hot during the day. Um, so this project had funding to be built but it didn't have a continuous source of revenue to help pay for the operations and maintenance. Um, so it was really important for the design to include a low cost uh, maintenance strategy. And as I mentioned, given the environment of the extreme kind of temperature swing, they couldn't just solve for that with, with air conditioning and heating. Um, they needed to find better ways to really manage those, those temperature swings. So what we did with the design firm on this particular project we looked at the local species in terms of how those local species actually do convention and countercurrent heat exchange, which was ultimately the function that we were solving for. And the inspiration that we brought to the project focused on thermal regulation found in these local species uh, and provided the ecological intelligence to help the design team create a building that was fit to place and based on intel from, from the local organisms. And what was probably um, most exciting and, and one of my favorite projects um, because of this is that the fact that there were there were multiple stakeholders. So you had the you had um, city and federal government, a local government, federal government. You had tribes, community members, all people that really cared about this space, and they all had different ideas of what this place needed to be. Um, and so when different designs were being presented, they all kind of had different reactions to them uh, based on preferences and ideals and, and what their vision was. But when the, when the designers were able to present designs that were inspired by the local species, it was something that they could all get excited about because they all had connection to place and they all had some sort of connection to um, the organisms of, of that place um, because of that connection. So it was a really great way to kind of align the stakeholders around the design. And so what you see here, um, this is the center itself, uh, which integrated uh, a variety of different kind of design strategies that help manage, um, inspired by the, um, uh, really focused on the black-tailed jackrabbit was where a lot of the design inspirations came from. And that informed um, the solutions that were able to kind of meet that challenge need. And then kind of a side benefit of the project is the, the work that we did around the research of the, the place, the, the genius, the, the nature of place, everything that we studied was then integrated into the uh, center itself in terms of what we learned about the biology and how that actually helped inform the building space. So the work kind of became a, an educational tool um, as well uh, for, for the community. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the work that we've been doing together with Jacobs um, around this idea of positive impact. The two examples I just shared were kind of um, examples that, that are kind of general biomimicry applied to the built environment. We've evolved our work um, in the last five years to be a little bit more targeted and specific around this notion of buildings that have positive impact, uh, facilities that have positive impact, cities that have positive impact. And that was really built off of this um, quote from our founder um, that when she, she had made this observation uh, when flying kind of over a city, seeing like there was the city and there was the forest. And she kind of made this comment that, you know, when our cities are, are functionally indistinguishable from the forest, then that's, when we know that um, we reach true sustainability, and she says it much more eloquently, that's when we'll really be home at this planet, right? And so what we're talking about of being functionally indistinguishable from the forest next door is really creating those same ecosystem services that our designs create those ecosystem services like the forest next door. 
Um, so we've really started to look at how can our design do that. And again, biomimicry is really an incredible system thinking practice. So it allows us to look holistically at a system um, to really understand how to um, design in a way that, that can produce benefits. So for us, it's, it's really this kind of holistic approach to reinforce the, the system of systems and that nature um, as, as a measure, right? So for, for this process of what does it look like to be regenerative, we can look to nature as that design inspiration because when we look at how those local um, ecosystems are performing in terms of the benefits that are producing, that's something we can actually measure. And we'll get into that um, in a little bit more specificity, but it's this idea that um, we can be a little bit more holistic about our design and not solving for a particular design solution, but solving for the system as a whole. So we, we've launched this initiative called Project Positive, um, which is a kind of targeted methodology and framework that fits into any other framework, uh, building design um, or, or um, performance sustainability um, strategies as well, um, that really gives people an, a process for creating a um, design solution or creating a um, process for designing in a way that's that's producing benefits. So I'm going to talk through, so it really kind of developed um, on this idea, and I mentioned this, that, that our ecosystems are generous and that our buildings and communities can be too. And so the framework that we developed was really kind of around this four-step process of um, identifying context and conditions to place, kind of what we call the nature of place contextual analysis. And by understanding place and what's important to that place, we can better design for, for that um, to be fit to place. And to understand what does that need to look like from a performance perspective, we quantify the ecosystem services of a local reference uh, habitat, a local ecosystem that is performing. So whether that's a nearby park or a, um, a uh, kind of untouched open space, anything that's basically an intact ecosystem, we can measure and look at what are the ecosystem services being delivered by that site and really use that as the performance goal, the performance standard for what we should be aiming for in that place. And then really looking at the site itself, how is it currently performing in comparison to that reference site, looking at that performance gap analysis to understand what is it that we need to be solving for, and then creating design strategies that will help close that performance gap to help the site um, city or, or building move closer to functioning like uh, and performing like that ecosystem next door. And then really the fourth step, and this is really a lot of where our, our work with um, the create and implement has really been a part of our work with Jacobs, is then integrating those design strategies um, and operationalizing those to help move towards, towards positive. So it's really applying biomimicry in, in a couple different ways. It's we're emulating the performance of the local ecosystem at a, um, at a quantifiable level. And then once we go into the, um, the actual design strategies, how are we gonna solve those performance gaps? We look to the local organisms and the local species to help inform our design strategies. Um, and I'm gonna give you a couple different examples of, of that. And I'm gonna go through it kind of quickly because I want Chris to talk about a few um, so that we can leave some time for Q and A. Um, but this is a project that we worked on, uh, Jacobs and B38 um, worked together on a project with, and is still working on a project with Ford Motor Company. It's kind of been evolving. Um, but, the, but initially what we started with was three project sites, uh, four different facilities. So we were looking at their Dearborn uh, site, which was a, um, a mix of new facilities and existing facilities, um, both offices, office space and manufacturing. And then we looked at um, another site, which is a restoration project and a mixed use facility um, in Detroit, in kind of downtown Detroit area. 
And then we also looked at some office space that they have in El Cristo, Mexico, which was a greenfield site. Um, so we had different operating conditions around each one of these uh, facilities and each of these three physical location sites. But just to kind of walk you through that kind of four step process um, and through an actual example, we looked at two different local reference habitats um, and quantified the performance of those habitats uh, is what you see here. So we're looking at water cycle, water quality, air quality, carbon, climate, soil, biodiversity, health and well-being. We're looking at um, what you see here is the baseline. This is how the site itself um, is performing and then the how the local ecosystem is performing. So you can see the, the performance gap is quite significant in what we're solving for. So then really working together with the B3 and Jacobs teams, kind of identifying a suite of design strategies that would help solve for those key areas of um, climate, carbon, water, air, soil, and, and integrating those um, on the outside of the building, as well as the inside of the building, looking at strategies that would close the performance gap inside the building, such as um, this particular slide is uh, talking to um, CLT and the use of um, uh, lumber, that particular, um, cross laminated timber for um, lowering embodied carbon. Also looking at phytoremediation walls and how that can help with air quality and health and well-being performance. And then combining those and looking you know, at the different design interventions and seeing how does that move the needle for the, um, for the sites and looking at, okay, this was their baseline. And then as we introduce different design scenarios, how does, help, how does that help them get closer to performing like the ecosystem next door. And so really for our project, we looked at kind of this roadmap for how they would move forward with integrating this for all their sites. And that was a key part of our deliverable was not only the design interventions and understanding their current performance and gap analysis, but how would they move forward in integrating this um, in, in the future. Another project that we've done um, is working with the city of Amsterdam. This is a project with C40, um, Kate Rayworth and her team at Donut Economics Action Lab um, and the B3 team really looking at how to apply this thinking at, um, at a city level. And ultimately what, what our work did was give them with a decision-making and a, an evaluation tool to help them understand where their impacts were and um, where they could have um, benefit in terms of that kind of answering this question of what would it mean uh, for, for Amsterdam to thrive within its natural habitat? What would that look like? So really using the, the positive performance framework to kind of help answer that question. Um, and we're really proud of the project in terms of um, what it produced as a roadmap to help Amsterdam think about um, for their strategy of how to build back better after COVID-19. Um, so those are two particular examples. Um, Chris, I'll turn it over to you to talk about some specifics from the Jacobs side that we've recently been working on. Thanks, Nicole. As I mentioned uh, at, the, at the top of the presentation, oh, Jacobs has been working with Biomimicry 3.8 for about eight years. So I'll, I'll just kind of I'll walk through a, a number of examples of different applications of, of biomimicry uh, principles, primarily in large scale master planning uh, applications. So currently we're working um, on two different projects for the University of California Davis healthcare system. Uh, these are medical complexes. So uh, South Placer is, is a site just outside of uh, metropolitan Sacramento. It's a regional hospital. Um, Kind of medical complex you can see down in the lower right hand uh, lower left hand corner option two aerial so this is a, a greenfield site and because the university of california at davis has such a strong sustainability ethos um, they really invited us to to bring some innovative ideas and concepts to the table so um, they're known for a lot of their work in net zero uh, energy and net zero carbon planning we also wanted to put on the table the idea of uh, positive performance in Biomimicry 3.8. So uh, B3.8 was commissioned as a part of our uh, sustainability master plan to come in and do the nature of place uh, evaluation to look at what could we do on that greenfield site in a medical complex to drive these positive impacts and, and uh, uh, 
a retention of ecosystem services performance on that site, uh, even in, in the midst of a, a large scale medical complex. So uh, we've just completed that uh, sustainability master plan with the nature of place and uh, hopefully be moving into the design phase of that with a design partner. Um, this is about a 15 year build out, so it's a long scale program, but we're, we're excited to have these kind of key ecological indices in place in the University of California Davis supporting integrating this type of thinking into, into this master plan. Um, it's about a 60 acre site. And next slide, Nicole. Another uh, large scale master plan we've done, this was completed about six years ago, I believe now, which is in Morocco with our client OCP, which is the, uh, the Kingdom of Morocco's phosphate manufacturing um, company. It's a wholly owned uh, state or state owned uh, company uh, at Morocco, as you probably know, is the largest phosphate manufacturer in the world. Uh, they're trying to move towards more sustainability in their uh, in their process and their manufacturing. So uh, in Safi, which is a, a large scale industrial zone, they wanted a, a master plan that would lead them towards greater levels of sustainability. So we uh, again commissioned Biomimicry 3.8 to come in and do the nature place analysis on this coastal site. Uh, in on the Atlantic coast in Morocco, where we are again able to identify key species and um, kind of the ecological dy dynamics on site so that we can move the thinking and move the design performance towards uh, uh, greater levels of positive impact, not only on the environment, but for the employees in the surrounding um, coast as well. And we also did some preliminary work in, in kind of an industrial ecology mapping of how they can begin to potentially close some loops on some of their manufacturing processes, looking at uh, analogs from ecology. Um, next one is also another one for OCP was uh, a new uh, technical city that they're uh, conceiving of developing also on the coast of Morocco. This would be a brand new city uh, that they would like to use as a uh, economic development kind of a, a smart city, if you will, right on the coast there. So again, we went through the nature place process with, with Biomimicry 3.8, looking at what are the key species, what are the key ecological dynamics, and how can that inform a master plan and, and design so that we're getting to that towards that positive performance. And this was informed a lot by uh, what they call a wadi, which is the kind of the outflow that you can see there from a um, from a, a riparian uh, area area higher up in the desert that then comes out as an outfall in the ocean and if we were to develop a project around that how could that wadi and the systems around that salt marsh uh, inform and, and be integrated into the master plan next next slide uh, Jacobs also competed in the Red Sea project in Saudi for a, a, also another coastal city project here we were not successful in the design, but this was a paid um, paid competition. So we were able to commission B3 again to help us think through learning about a particular uh, ecological system in the desert on the coast and how would that inform a, a design. And we came up with a wonderful design. Unfortunately, it wasn't successful for this project, but because we have so much work in Saudi, we'll be able to use and, and repurpose a lot of the uh, genius of place, nature of place, uh, ecological design principles for you know, a range of work in these kind of hot desert environments adjacent to the ocean. Next slide. Um, relatively recently, we also worked with Biomimicry 3.8, a public school uh, master planning project. This is in Virginia, I believe. Uh, the school really wanted to try to integrate uh, leading edge sustainability principles and Biomimicry 3.8 Jacobs and a local architecture firm uh, went through the Nature Place project and brought, uh, again, a lot of ecological design principles ideas from local organisms and a, a way to integrate this in a way that also could be part of the curriculum and part of the teaching program for the, the local public school there. And so that was a, another example of a, a great collaboration with, with B3A. And then lastly, I'd like to point to some uh, new work that we've started with the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, many of you may be familiar with uh, the Inter uh, Engineering Research and Development Center of the Army Corps of Engineers. They've recently started something called the Network for Engineering with Nature. Uh, this is led by Dr. Todd Bridges and also with the University of Georgia's Institute for Sus uh, Sustainable and Resilient Infrastructure, where they're beginning to incorporate ideas of uh, learning from nature and engineering with nature in, in large uh, scale civil projects. 
We've been working with uh, the Army Corps on uh, Department of Defense facilities using these engineering with nature pr uh, principles. First and foremost at Tyndall Air Force Base and the rebuild there in a large scale 18 mile uh, long uh, coastal dune restoration program to help build back after Hurricane Michael wiped out uh, Tyndall in 2018. So uh, we're really excited to be working with the Army Corps and uh, we'll be bringing Biomimicry 3.8 into that relationship as that moves forward. So in sum, we have a lot of exciting projects and so we've started an internal training program within Jacob so that we can train up a lot of a lot more people to um, be able to use these practices and principles to drive our uh, approach to sustainability and resilience as we bring these innovative ideas to our clients. So I will stop there and then I think that leaves us, Michelle, with about 15 minutes for Q&A if anybody would like to, to jump in from here. Sure, thank you both for presenting. Um, there was a, a question that came through on the chat. It says, how did you quantify the performance of different aspects of the ecosystem in the zero to 100% range? Um, I think this is, yeah, Nicole, when you were speaking. Yeah, so the, the way that we go about quantifying uh, the different habitats is we look at um, essentially the, the landscape attributes like what are the different attributes that are provided by that landscape? And that essentially goes into a model. We have um, a partnership with Ecometric Solution uh, Group that does all of our modeling. Um, they're uh, ecologists and ecosystem service ex experts. So really what they're able to do is come in and provide that baseline performance, looking at the, um, the reference site itself. And so what we do, is we look at kind of three criteria. We look at what are the um, ecological priorities of that place? What are the social, historical, kind of cultural um, needs and priorities of that place? And then what is the um, kind of goals, priorities, and needs of the kind of primary um, stakeholder? And really through, through the understanding of those three things, we're able to kind of under, we're able to identify kind of the key functional needs that we want to solve for. Maybe that's biodiversity, maybe that's air, maybe that's soil, maybe it's water, um, but it starts to give us a sense of what those priorities are. But then when we look at the site itself, we can, we, we're going to measure everything, air, soil, water, bio, like biodiversity, we're looking at all of it. And so when we get that assessment of how, um, how it's performing based on those landscape attributes, and we get that gap analysis, then we can start to figure out what we want to lean into based on those priorities that were identified. I'm not sure who asked the question, but maybe, hopefully that helps answer it. Or Chris, do you wanted to add more to it? Uh, I think that covered it. Great. Well, if anyone else has any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat or turn on your camera or just raise your hand or unmute however you feel comfortable in asking your question. And I will add like we gave a lot of um a lot of content in a short amount of time <laughs> so we did kind of give like the thirty thousand of the level so um if there's anything like more specific that can be helpful let us know we're happy to dig in you know what we might put up on the screen nicole would be the ask nature site too as a reference oh yeah definitely um i can absolutely pull that up so we have a sister nonprofit called the biomimicry institute and um, we have worked with them um, over the years to create a site called asknature.org. And what you can do is basically go into the site, I'm pulling it up here and I'll share my screen, um, go into the site and ask it any sort of question in terms of what would nature do. So if you were looking at stormwater management, if you were looking at, um, uh, you know, whatever, whatever kind of design uh there we go uh strategy so you can look here there's um there's different collections biological strategies innovations there's a whole spot for educators um but then you can you can search as well if you know what kind of like your functional challenge is um you enter your kind of keyword here so if we were looking at um Oh, here, we'll just let it do its thing, right? So produce oops, color. Oh, it's almost like a type. There we go. 
Um, so it kind of shows you all the different biological strategies around color and structural color and how nature does color. Um, and you can see there's biological strategies or different, there's, um, if there's an innovation, like a technology that exists, it links you to that. Um, so it's a really incredible resource if you're just looking to answer the question, you know, what would nature do um, in, in context to basically anything um, from, a, from a design perspective. Nicole, if you would click on the innovations button, I think that's a pretty interesting example of the breadth of what's going on in, in biomimetic research globally. I think that's. Um, yeah, you bet. Just kind of go through. You can see that it's broken down into different uh, sector like materials, robotics. Uh, well, the clean water and sanitation would be interesting for this group, medical and biotechnology. And this this site is really aggregating all of this, both uh, research, uh, pure research, applied research, and um, uh, commercialization, innovation, all of that together here to kind of give a breadth of the whole field. So it's it's quite a resource if you're interested in this topic at all. That's great. It looks like we just have two comments in here. Um, someone said, seems like a great resource, so thank you for that. And then someone else said a recommended reading for perspective is the earth as modified by human action. Hmm. Yeah. And then I'll also add to that reading list, um, Janine Benyus, her, she wrote a, uh, the book on biomimicry in 1997, Biomimicry Innovation Inspired by Nature. Um, and it's still probably, even though it was written almost 20 years ago or over 20 years ago, um, super, uh, relevant, even more relevant maybe today. So I, I would also recommend that reading as well. Great. Anyone else have any other questions for the chat? Steven. Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, uh, I have a comment for all of you. Thank you very, very much for A, organizing this presentation, and B, for the work that the two wonderful presenters are doing. Uh, I, I was an educator for 40 years at the University of Washington. We've done a lot of work over the past on uh, all kinds of things. We were teaching porous pavement uh, design uh, back in 1996 when other people didn't think it was possible. But what you're doing is exceptional. But one of the things we have to watch out for, if you look at the green roof on the Chicago City Hall, it uh, it failed this last year because nobody maintained it. So one of the things with the Coast Guard, uh, a lot of people are not paying attention to soil health. And that is one of the single biggest issues we face. And you're using synthetic soils on these roofs. So there's a real, there's a whole culture and training needed of horticulture to do this and do this well. But what you're doing, you're designed for the Forest Service, this is clever stuff. This is the kind of thing that we need people to think in very, very wide domain. So thank you for it. And I'm going to make sure people in other universities are well aware of what you're doing, because a lot of them are not too well aware of what they're up to. So thank you. Thank you for that, Stephen. Yeah, thank you. Looks like there is another comment in the chat. It says, for Nicole, what specific aspect of the jackrabbit biology did you employ in the first project, the heat exchange that you presented? Yeah, so um, I can speak to it at a high level. If you want the super specifics, I'll, I'll um, ask our biologist. But essentially, it was the the ability for the jackrabbit, so it has these really long ears, right? So it's the ability to kind of move heat throughout its body in that countercurrent heat exchange that was done um, in the jackrabbit. The, the ability of which it was able to do that is what was um, emulated. So it was really kind of like the long distances, the, the scale, the, the size, and how that was used um, to then kind of inform the thinking. Um, so that it was it's essentially the the heat exchange process that was used in the jackrabbit, particularly in its ears, uh, that were part of what inspired the, the strategy. 
I think that project proof is on Ask Nature too, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. So somebody could probably look that up. Is that is that design principle on, on the Ask Nature site, Nicole? Um, that's a good question. I haven't looked recently to see if it is, but um, I can I can I can do that. And I know we also have a detailed case study on that project um, on our website. So there's definitely um, uh, and and it's been written about. If you if you literally Google the um, the center, that um, you'll you'll find a, several different articles that were written about it um, that give kind of more depth to to the um, I think impact and the kind of thinking that went into that building. The, the key trick in biomimicry is is taking the biology and then translating that to a design principle that an architect or an engineer can use. And that's that's kind of the secret sauce, right? And it's it, biomimicry has created a language, kind of a language bridge between biology into design, designers of all kind, and that's that's really where the where the magic happens, so to speak. Um, as you know, most most architects and engineers are not super conversant in biology and vice versa. Most biologists are not super conversant in design principles for the built environment. So biomimicry is really that translating language bridge that allows the, the different professions to speak to each other and exchange information. And that's that's where the value is created. It looks like there is another question. Is there any project where biomimicry was applied to the design of highways or any other transportation project? Oh yeah, uh, there's a handful. Um, there's a really um, a great example um, from a community. I think it was in uh, Shenzhen, China, where they actually studied um, they used the algorithms uh, for ants in terms of how ants um, communicate and how they do their signaling to inform how the city designed and laid out um, their roadway system. Um, so there was some really cool biology that went into um, in the inspiration behind that particular system. And there's quite a bit on transportation and signaling. Um, nature and organisms um, are really incredible about doing decentralized communication very well. Um, so when that kind of thinking and that's when those strategies are applied to um, anything from uh, transportation systems to even um, organizational structure. Um, again, it can be applied in, in a multiple different ways, but there's quite a bit on uh, decentralized communication and, and um, using that to, to create uh, uh, connected systems. And then there was another question about if biomimicry was used to apply, agri uh, sorry, was applied to minimize agricultural runoff. Yeah, again, there, there's a lot, the whole sector of um, regenerative ag, that whole space of, of, of regenerative ag is really essentially using nature to benefit um, agriculture production. And so runoff is a component of, of the agricultural production process and how to manage for that, how to mitigate against that. So uh, again, what we're looking at, if we're looking at um, a runoff issue uh, really in an agriculture context, we would be looking at the, the context of that challenge and, and looking again at, at the system. Um, but there, but I know in particular, there's irrigation systems that are designed based on biology that minimize um, runoff and max or optimize the water usage based on kind of conditions and um, and I am blanking on the actual technology uh, name, but the, but yeah, there there is an abundance of app of applications there. Perfect. We might have time for one more if anybody has the last call for questions. Going once, mm -hmm. going twice. <laughs> All right, well, with no takers, thank you both Chris and Nicole for presenting. It was a very informative and very interesting presentation. Um, for everyone, there, our next meeting is July 15th. We're gonna be having Leslie Webster from Seattle Public Utilities talking 
about Seattle, the Seattle Shape Our Water Resiliency Project. So we'll see you all next time. And thank you again, Chris and Nicole, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Thanks for having Bye -bye. us. Take care. Thanks.